Welcome to Alito's Church Online. We are so excited that you're here worshiping with us today. So we invite you to like, to share, and to comment, to let us know that you're here worshiping. And now let us join together and proclaim, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And now let us sing together, love divine, all loves excelling. Before we go to God in prayer, I invite you to please continue to lift Tom Seiler and Jordan Stowe in your prayers, as well as all those listed on our prayer concerns. If you have prayer concerns that you'd like to share, please get in touch with us. Will you go to God in prayer with me, please? Holy and gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we can be together in spirit and visit each other um, through so many other mediums and even when we can't be in together in person. It seems like this is dragging on, Lord, and we find it so frustrating sometimes. And uh, we just pray that you would continue to encourage us, uh, help us to know that you walk with us through this difficult time. I pray especially for those who are lonely, those who are isolated, those who are in need of your touch and your healing. We lift them to you, Lord, and we pray that you would be very present to them, that they would experience your love and your comfort and your peace. Lord, you remind us all the time that we are called to be the hands and feet, the heart and the very presence of Christ. So help us during this time to remember to reach out to those who maybe especially can't, can't get to church or um, don't have family around them. Just bring them to our, to our minds and to our hearts, Lord, that we would reach out to them in love. Lord, we continue to pray for those who are researching not only coronavirus, but all the different illnesses that, um, that we deal with in this life. And we ask you to keep them safe, and we pray for the doctors and nurses who are uh, battling every day to keep us healthy and strong. We especially list, lift those who are struggling with illnesses, and we pray for those who are going through treatments and surgery, recovering from all kinds of things and just pray that you would surround them with your love and your peace. We love you, Lord. Forgive us for the times we fail you, where we fail one another. And thank you for sending your son as a perfect example of how to love, how to forgive, how to share, how to be 
truly Christ-like to one another. We pray all these things in his precious name as we share the prayer he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For today is from the book of Philippians. The first reading is from chapter 1, verse 6. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. And the second reading, also from Philippians, is from chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning. Let's have a prayer before we begin our message this morning. Heavenly Father, as we pray for your words, we pray for your will in spite of the nature and the limitation of the presenter and through the power of the Holy Spirit that your will is done in the words that are spoken this day. And I ask these things in the name of the risen Christ Jesus and all of God's church said together, amen. I want you to turn in your Bibles at home. Now, you know I'm talking to you, and so you know you don't get off the hook any more than anyone else does, right? We're in worship. Get your Bible, get your tablet, get your phone. Only four chapters to worry about in this particular piece that we're going to talk about today. But I want you to think before we begin today specifically about the nature of encouragement. Can you think of a time in your life where you knew when you were in relation with someone somewhere, verbally or by letter, telephone, text, Facebook, email, doesn't matter, but they were encouraging to you and what that felt like. These are times as Trudy prayed, I can't think of a more truthful prayer that we need to hear. You're tired of this and we're tired of this. Amen, church? We want something new. We want to go back where we were. We desire that so much. But in the meantime, we're called to encourage each other. We need to encourage each other all the time because as Christians, we have all the encouragement we really need and how easily we forget. I think about the nature of the church and how we're continuing to move forward. Programming was started this week. Teresa did a great job with her volunteers, with our children. People showed up in the parking lot for outdoor worship, listening to 89.1. And by the way, if you can eat out in a restaurant and check in on Facebook, you can check right into worship. If this applies to you, no judgment. But either get on TV like you're doing now and stay there and let's do Bible stay together and get out in your car at 89.1. You can run the air conditioner. You can turn me down if you want to. Sit and meditate. But come onto the church campus. You have every opportunity to do so and we'll have more coming in the future. But it felt good. I don't know about anyone else, but I have a feeling people would answer pretty positively. It felt good to see children run into the door and we would say, hang on, we got to escort you in. We got to be careful. But they were dying to get in and run through the foyer to go and actually be the church. It felt good to see adults in the parking lot sitting in their car. It just felt good. And I'm going to give you the nature of what that means in terms of a Greek and somewhat Latin term, koinonia. Koinonia is the common bond we all have, and particularly as, question, as Christians, it comes in a contextual nature. And that is to say, koinonia, I would say, in Christ. A common bond that we all have, but it encompasses so much. I want to tell you about the church that Paul writes in this letter to the churches at Philippi. And in Macedonia, they were on a trade route. Now, a lot of these, Corinth was that way specifically. 
But the trade route in Macedonia, for some reason, did not corrupt the church in the way it did as we read in the Corinthian church. When Paul writes Corinth, they're having a real problem. But here's what happens. Even in the church in Macedonia, the churches at Philippi, we know that there is a conflict between two people. But in the midst of that conflict, Koinonia overrides all of it. And they remember to do good and they send Paul a gift. Now we're not exactly sure exactly how much the gift was. We believe it to be a financial aid or help and encouragement. We know Timothy was a great encourager for a good while with Paul. But he wants to remind them that the gift really means something coming from them. He has a special kinship with this church. Along a trade route where they could have simply lost their way and decided that the the profits that they were making and how they were doing. So I want you to picture this. This is the best way to describe it on a map. So I'm going to use what we call hand mapping, if you've ever heard of that. So you can see my hand like this. My thumb's coming up. We have the Aegean Sea, and then up we begin to hit the land. And it goes up through the churches Philippi is closer to the sea, but then it goes up through the mountain ranges and it connects the east and Italy all together. Now you're talking about a huge region of trade. So people are coming in and in influx. And this church hasn't lost its way, but it has a common bond, as we call, called humanity. You ever been a human or know someone who is one? And sometimes when you get different personalities and different people in one place, and nowadays even in two places, someone in Europe can get in an argument on Facebook with somebody in Egypt. Interesting times in which we live because the human condition transcends that form of media. But in this particular case, we know there's a conflict and Paul ignores the conflict until the fourth chapter. There are only four chapters in Philippians, just four. But in the four chapters, I love how Paul relates to the church. First, he wants to tell them he's thankful for them. And one of the things I try and do with staff, because I am thankful for them, and I'm thankful for getting to be the pastor of this church, is to remind them every week, I am thankful for them. Something that I want to add in an addendum today, Trudy and I were just sitting out here, Trudy and Teresa and I, Thomas was singing and Krista was playing, And it was beautiful. And Trudy looked at me and said, isn't it amazing how everyone has different gifts? I could never dream of sitting down at this instrument. I know two songs on the piano. One is Home Sweet Home by Motley Crue, written by Tommy Lee, the great composer. Some of you know who I'm talking about. And if you don't, don't worry about it. And the other is a basic form of nothingness I picked out in like the first grade. So when nobody's watching and I'm at the church, I come down and I play those two songs. And then I'm out. I'm out of ammo. I have nothing else. And I sit and watch Krista sit down here. And she could be thinking about a recipe for all I know. Effortlessly, her fingers and hands fly up and down the keyboard. And it is beautiful. And then Thomas gets up. And just start singing. And it's on key. And it's on pitch. And it's on rhythm. And he knows where to come in and what measure. I don't have any of that. But boy, does that provide joy. To hear someone sing a hymn. And hear someone play an instrument. And I get to rejoice in that. 16 times, either joy or rejoice. And I preached about joy. Joy or rejoice 16 times is used in four chapters here in this particular letter. And Paul says, you all have different talents. But I do rejoice. I'm grateful for you. And what a blessing it is to sit out here and see an incredible staff. I get to go around. Trudy's taking me around to the houses right now. And boy, do I get to rejoice. I get to visit with these people like I've known them. And Trudy may tell you, but it makes you feel like you've known them forever. You have koinonia with them. You have similar experiences. But the main experience we have together is in Jesus Christ. And that opens up so many doors. And so 
Paul wants to write this church and say, you know what, I'm grateful for you. I really am. I'm grateful for you. I'm going to give you an assignment. And I'm going to do it again so you don't forget. I want you to find three people this week in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I want you to remind them that you are grateful for them. Now, here's the rub. It's three people in your life who you and I may have not told as of late how grateful we are for them. You ever have anybody in your life that you take for granted? You kind of just subconsciously make the assumption. Paul, in this particular letter, doesn't want to do that at all. And he says, oh, I'm so grateful for you. I am so grateful for you. Thank you for the gift. We don't know exactly what the gift particularly was. But we know, number one, he can rely on these people. And two, he wants to instill the value they have in his life. The reason I like the term koinonia so much is that we could go around the world and be among Christians and have a common understanding and a common bond as Christ is our Savior. And one of the things we're called to do, essentially, last I checked, was to go out and make disciples of Jesus Christ and create as much koinonia as we possibly can, like a syndrome around the globe. And I say that to you today because we need to remember when we are grateful and we state that we are grateful. It is pleasing to Almighty God. I found myself this morning saying, it's another week, I can think of 10 different things we could do with person-to-person -person programming without COVID. And I know right now at home, you can think of 10 things right now that you would normally be doing in some sense of normalcy that you can't do. It's very difficult for pastors to pray with people and not want to hold hands when someone is in grief and we cannot give them a hug. And you think about separating in the physical nature of things. And it's so funny now, I took my mask off earlier. I walked out in the hallway and a staff member was walking by me and I did this as if it was gonna change something. I found myself going, as if every germ by my hand would be blocked somehow. Either from me to them or from them to me. Isn't this a strange time in a way? But if we address it in the nature of what Paul talks about, in the Christian nature of koinonia, then we will be in a natural state of rejoicing. I tell you that because I think about the nature of many people in my life that I have met that are a joy to be around. And they're a joy to be around because they remind me that I do need to be grateful. You ever around anyone in your life and they remind you of something almost speaking as God and reminding you through the power of the Holy Spirit that you could do or be something more than you are? That is to say, with a grateful heart, rejoice. And in 4.4 here, Paul says, rejoice. And then he doesn't stop there. He says, I say again, rejoice. Do you hear that? That's amen, church. And the church goes, amen. And Paul goes, oh, no. Get up. I say again, rejoice. It's a good thing. Be motivated about telling people that they matter. Folks, our mission in Koinonia together as the church of Jesus Christ is to go out and make disciples. Now, what does that even mean right now with COVID? School starting. Where do I go? How do I go there? I drop my children off in a school. I've never had the experience where I drop them off having never been inside that edifice at all and just hope and pray everything's okay. Handed them off to strangers and they walked away. That was your experience too if you drop kids off today. But then I stopped for a minute and I began to think, what a privilege it is to have a wonderful school with educators that are putting themselves out there for some at incredible health risk. Trying to educate our precious children that we are grateful for. And I had to stop myself for a minute and just say, you know, we've got to be grateful. Paul reminds us of that, does he not? In these precious four chapters, he even acknowledges that there's a little bit of conflict between two people. 
Have you ever been around two people in conflict and you're not involved at all and yet you feel like you've done something or you need to do something to stop the conflict? And it may be in a church, it may be in the office, it may be with family, but doesn't it feel, as my daughter would say, a little bit ooky? Ooky. You know what ooky is. Ooky is, I don't want to walk into this. Oh, I'm not in the room to hear your side or your side. And when Paul gets to chapter 4, he finally says, just before this, two verses before, he says, rejoice, I say again. You know, when we do it, we go, rejoice, I say again, rejoice. You know how Paul was. You know Paul's demeanor. What do you think Paul said? He said, rejoice, lock down. No, no, not loud enough. I say again, rejoice. And you know, can you imagine they went, okay, we'll rejoice. We will. Years ago, I remember an old master sergeant and we would be freezing to death in the field and we'd come out and yell at you and then give you hot soup. Paul's alike like that old master sergeant that rode around in in a Humvee. He would come up and he'd have soup all over him. He was covered in soup. He smelled like a giant Campbell's soup can. And he was wringing wet. He would hold on to pots and pans and carafes and gear that wouldn't stay fastened and bounce around roads and he would walk up to you freezing to death, sitting in a tank, and he would say something like, there's trash all over, pick it up, it's ridiculous. Get soup. Everyone get soup right now. He never said, I'm grateful for you. He never said, I love you. But did he? A man that bounces down a road and spills soup all over himself, it sounds like a giant soup can. What he was saying to us now, I know, was, I rejoice for you. Again, I'm going to say rejoice. We want the conventional and the gentle nature, but sometimes it applies where it applies and the nature it applies to. That is to say, however you can reach someone, do that. Paul adds the realistic humanity to this scripture in particular to say, you know what, you need to do good where good needs to be done and good needs to be done everywhere. I often hear churches with mission statements and I always love the I'm the kind of person who... If I come and visit, I don't want to hear what kind of person you are. I don't want to hear what kind of church you are. I want to hear what your mission is. Is your mission two things? One, rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. And two, is your mission involving koinonia? That is to say, as a group to go out and make disciples of Jesus Christ? You know the answer, not one of the answers. You don't have a Unitarian preacher here. You have a Wesleyan preacher. And so I'm never going to say there are many roads because last I checked, if I get on 20 East, I'm not going to make it to China. Many roads don't make it to the same destination. Jesus says, I am the way and I am the truth and I am the life. And Paul is reflecting that right here in the book. He writes to Philippi and he says, listen, keep the positive nature of who you are. Remember your common bond in Christ, and I am grateful for you. Settle your conflicts. I know you're fallible, but I'm grateful for you. Church of Jesus Christ, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you find three people in your life that you are grateful for, and you show them the words, rejoice again. I say, I rejoice in you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all of God's church said, Amen. I want to remind you, along with the invitation that we give each and every time we worship together, that we have live worship at 9 o'clock in the parking lot at 89.1 on the radio. You can pull up, tune in, run your air conditioner, and hear a sermon. We'll have music this Sunday. We'll read scripture this Sunday. We'll have a sermon this Sunday. It's at 9 o'clock in the parking lot, right in the backside of the plant here, on the other side, far side of the sanctuary. We also have worship at 11 o'clock live right here in the sanctuary. We ask that you wear a mask and that you social distance. The sanctuary is marked thusly. We even have room in the balcony for you. So please know that is available to you. 
We also ask that if you'd like to accept Christ as your Savior, if you'd like to be baptized, or you would like to join with this congregation, I promise you, you won't find a better group of people who are sinners just trying to get it right. And we would feel overjoyed that you made that decision. Please know you are welcome. And now let us join together as we come to a close and sing of God's great creation as we sing, This is my Father's world. church is doing many things, continuing programming, and I notice if you read the newsletter, you'll notice that it's ramping up more and more so. We are giving plenty, in fact, more than we ever have in benevolent giving right now, and that requires all of our tithes and offerings. And so if you hit push pay, or you have a check, or you have direct debit from your account, we ask that maybe you want to chip in a little bit more. Maybe we can make more food bags. Maybe we could give multiple bags to the people that come that ask every time that they could have multiple bags. Sometimes we can't because the demand is great. That might be a great gold in telling God again, I say rejoice. And so please know that your offering is not only accepted, but it is utilized to the glory of God. Amen. And now in the name of Jesus Christ, let us be full, let us be empty, let us have all things, let us have nothing. Let us be employed for you or laid aside for you, brought high or low for you. Lord, let us have all things, let us have nothing. Because in you we have Jesus Christ and may we go out into your world and teach the world that Jesus is the answer. And may we do it with koinonia, the common bond we have, with Christ as the sinner, as our Savior. Go in peace in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.